mirror twins, which is even more rare. Andrea is left-handed, Dee is right-handed. Their hair actually goes a different direction, exact opposite of each other, and a lot of characteristics of them are like mirror images. Having a twin is, is um, having someone in your life that has the absolute same life experience. She was born the same time to the same parents. Uh, we shared a room forever. Uh, we had went to the same schools, sometimes had the same teachers. There was a great mutuality in growing up. So, so it was the same childhood. That's what, that's, it was the same childhood. It's look, like looking at the good side of the mirror and the dark side of the mirror. You know, you, you have someone who knows exactly what your life was because it was exactly their life too. The thing about twins is they have to have a separate life. You can't let, you can't be, oh, there are the twins. You know, you've got to be a person too. And uh, Mama was good about that, you know, not making us do the same things and finding our own, our own way in the world. Not making us do the same things and finding our own, our own way in the world. The small town is, is really charmed. Uh, uh, it was safe. It was um, uh, a neighborhood where we knew all of our neighbors and our parents knew uh, people in, in town and, and uh, Daddy worked at the, uh, at the post office and Mama worked at the local school and we walked to school and it was, it was um, Mayberry. I grew up in Mayberry. Mayberry. This is it. So you got away with nothing because everybody knew your dad. Um, and it was, it, it was what everybody wants to raise their child in today. But lots of kids, lots of trouble. Daddy was strict. He was, uh, you get grades or you go to the laundry. That's it. Two choices. I want good grades, and if you don't stay in school and get good grades, um, the man at the laundromat has told me that he'll have you work down there. And we, we believed it. We knew that was true. It gives you perspective real fast. No, I don't want to do that with my life. I'm going to pay a little more attention. My mother had a friend who uh, was, was a hairdresser. And uh, my mother had very few luxuries, but, but she, would, um, she would get her nails done, and she would get her hair done once in a while. And, and she made uh, friends with this woman, uh, Sandy, who would come to the house often. We saw her unadopted daughter, and um, Dee just thought she was absolutely fabulous. And, and she and Mama would light up a cigarette, and, and Sandy would do Mama's nails. And they would talk and laugh and have this great time. And it was so seductive. It, was so, it looked like such fun, you know, that part of being a girl that's so much fun. Um, and, I, and I really got the itch to be a hairdresser. That was it. That was my dream, being a hairdresser. Deidre never did go to beauty school. She stuck to high school where she played the clarinet in the marching band. After graduation, she went to the local junior college, did some modeling, and worked as a disc jockey to pay the tuition. I had a radio show um, at WLIZ, Florida's old radio station, and um, uh, did news and weather and sports and interviewed people coming through town. My sister was on, and when she was on, we found our transistor radios. Which, if you're a kid, it's the neatest thing. Your sister talking on the radio, and you can walk around anywhere and hear it. But Deidre really didn't know what she wanted to do. Lost. I was lost. My parents had some friends in L.A. and said, you know what? You need to get out of this little small town and take a few weeks off and just get out of here. And put me on a plane. And that was really kind of it. And it happened so quickly, she was just all of a sudden gone. It was very, it was very odd. Um, I got the whole room to myself. Uh, and, and yet there was this whole other side of you. That's just not there and you don't know if they're okay. Deidre stayed in L.A. and took classes at Los Angeles Community College. I came out to L.A. for a summer and uh, was modeling to support college and 
um, then I had an agent say, well, then, then you should do some commercials because commercials pay more. And, and, and then somebody said, well, then you should try acting because that pays pretty well and you might get a series and then you could really you know, support yourself pretty well. So did some acting. And, uh, and the problem with it was that I kept, I kept having to drop classes because I was acting too much. So I couldn't keep up with the work, and so then I'd pick it up next semester, and and um, I kept thinking, well, I'll just do this acting thing until until I, I have a career. I woke up one day and thought, well, you have a career. Sally, get Dr. Brackett and 301 stat. Right away, Miss McCall. Deidre started with some small parts on television, including a recurring role on the hit series Emergency in 1972. Are those reports on the last blood sample? Mm-hmm. Oh, I loved Emergency. Rampart, this is Squad 51, Squad 51 Rampart. Yes, that was a great show. I was doing episodic television, you know, Nurse Nancy kind of stuff. A man to being dangerous and non-effective in doses above 100 milligrams. Just stuff, you know, blood pressure and... I don't even know what I did. I just did stuff. Increase at two-hour intervals, most effective. But, but there was a time when we were all, you know, we had several hair pieces. Oh, I was in heaven. The next year, Deidre was cast on a daytime drama, The Young and the Restless. I played Nurse Barbara. Oh, Nurse Barbara. And Barbara was the girlfriend of the lead character who'd had a child with him, and the child died, and he left town. And that was the beginning of the show. So I was his backstory. Uh, um, so I was, uh, I was on the show off and on for three years, more off and on. She also got a part in a children's series called Electra Woman and Dinah Girl. I thought, that sounds kind of like fun. Sure, I'll go do that for a while. I'll put on a, a, a cape and some boots and, and go make the world a safer place. Isn't that the Princess Cleopatra? The Pharaoh has betrayed me and I'm too dirty to be free. She was a superhero. She was a blonde, um, spandexed superhero. And she did it with, like everything else in her life, enormous commitment. Try aiming your beam up towards the projection booth. Maybe we can make this thing self-destruct. And at that same time came a casting call for another daytime soap. I screen tested and, and, uh, and went home. And my agent called me and said, oh my gosh, you got the job. And I thought, um, well, wait a minute. I'm no dummy, you know. Now, if, if I were screen testing with famous people, they didn't choose me. They chose famous people. They would have called them first, and they must have turned down the job. There's something wrong with this job. I'm not taking it. I'm not taking it. So I turned it down. Married lawyer Don Craig had a baby, lost the baby, was raped, divorced, and then stalked by the Salem Strangler. And, of course, the most important thing is the drama is the romantic element. That The first time you look at someone and you hear buzzers and gongs and the lights flash and the stars cross the sky, that you're telling the audience, as well as you know yourself, that this is it. This is the big story of your life. What are you doing here? Giving you the protection you need. What are you talking about? You refused police protection? That's tough. You've got it, as of now. Oh, no, I don't. We were oil and water from the beginning. I didn't like him, and he didn't like me, and I was, I was resentful of having somebody in my home uh, protecting me, and I didn't like it, and I wanted him gone. I've got cow poop on the tires of my truck, you know, so that's just kind of me, and she was the, the hoity-toity you know, townie that... Uh, um, the only thing she knew about a cow was that it made shoes and purses for her. And the relationship sort of grew, and, and um, it grew from there. I don't know how you explain it. It just, it, it just turned out to be magic. And uh, the cop and the doc uh, kind of blossomed from there. She uh, basically nurtured that relationship, knowing that it was going to benefit her. And, I mean... <laughs> Case in point, I need say no more. She's still working. 
he is one of the all-time funny people in my life and just could make me laugh by just entering the room. Deirdre did very well with all the men. They were all crazy about her. Meanwhile, the Salem Strangler storyline ended when the stalker killed Marlena. Or did he? No. No, you silly thing. They were actually killing off Samantha, but they told the audience that it was Marlena. But it was me. Marlena's twin sister, Samantha, left the show, and in 1985, so did Roman. Or did he? It was a very difficult thing when he left the show, and we cast Drake Hogeston as this unknown guy, John Black, who ended up really being Roman Brady, for the fans that know the story. And the audience wanted him to be Roman, so he was Roman. She was looking for something new. I was looking to change venues. I had it in my head that daytime is not respected and nighttime is respected. So um, I set out to do something at nighttime. No hair dryer, no electric rollers, no electricity, period. In 1986, Deidre was cast as Jessie Witherspoon, a widowed mother of three in the series Our House. They didn't deliver the paper in those days. It was a story of survival family interaction, values, uh, uh, in-depth feelings. It's, it, it's a wonderful, wonderful family show. Deidre Hall made it such a warm experience. We were such a family, you know. She was, um, she was mom to me. She really was. Deidre continued her role as Marlena Evans on Days of Our Lives for the first season of Our House, becoming the first actress to do a daytime and nighttime series simultaneously. Then, when Our House began its second season, Deidre left Days of Our Lives. It was a blow to the show. Mm -hmm. It was a, a loss. Uh, for those on the show, it was, uh, it was like a divorce. Our House was canceled after two seasons, but Deidre had other things on her mind, besides her career. Now back to intimate portrait, Deidre Hall. Deidre Hall's dream to become a mother finally came true on August 23, 1992, but the moment was bittersweet. Her longtime friend and lawyer, Marcus Wasson, was dying of AIDS. Um, I also had a, a friend um, that was very sick at the time in the same hospital, and um, so uh, I had actually gotten the call um, uh, Robin had gone to the hospital with security people, and the hospital called, and I thought, they're saying, she's in a room, she's settled in, we're going to bring you in now, and it was, uh, it was my friend's doctors calling to say, if you... Hi. If you want to see Marcus, you better come now. So, I did. I went, um the hospital and, and spent, um, had been there every day and they finally um, um, spent some time with him. And he knew that David was about to be born. And just I kept saying, you just got to hold on. He's coming. He's coming. Um, and he did. He did. With Deidre and Steve by Robin's side, David Atticus Somer was born that night. And I'm reaching for him. He's ringing him, and I'm reaching for him. And, and the next thing I remember hearing was somebody saying, Hey, hey, wait, wait, he's still attached. And I, I, was, I was trying so hard to get him to my chest, to my heart, um, that I was pulling the cord. And Robin was saying, Whoa, wait a minute. <laughs> Not so fast. There's stuff to do yet. Um, um, just the, just the, 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 um, the fierce desperation, the urgency to get him next to me was so huge. Peter took a Polaroid of him and uh, went over to the next wing to see to show it to Marcus. Uh, and um, uh, when she gave him the photograph, he took it and he he put it against his uh, heart. And, uh, uh, you know, moments later, he was gone. I think they passed in the hall. I mean, I think that happens. And I think they probably did. 
he'd been very helpful in, in getting us on the road to surrogacy and make sure that all happened in, a, in, a, in a, an appropriate way. And so he was just kind of, wait. With a baby in her arms, Deidre's life was now full. She had her family, and she was back at work, having returned to her role as Dr. Marlena Evans on Days of Our Lives. I missed it terribly. I love the medium of daytime. I love the, the, the work. I love the work. And I had missed all that excitement. Excitement, excitement. <laughs> <laughs> sure, when she came back, excitement. And she creates excitement for the show, just her presence on it. Roman. It's Marlena. She was kept in sort of a coma-like state, like Robin Cook's book, Coma. And so we basically woke her up. She escaped and came back to cell looking as beautiful as ever. Oh and she was reunited with John Black. John Black still thought he was Marlena's husband, Roman. But the trouble was, the real Roman returned too. This created a very big problem. I fought my way back. I've, I've shark infested waters. I'm, I'm fighting my way. I'm starved. I haven't had a good, decent meal in years, and here I come crawling into Salem, and there you are, in bed with some other man, for crying out loud. And she thinks he's me. Marlena's character is tormented by her love of both men. Roman will be the love of her life, but John is her passion. John is the passion of her life. When John Black loved Marlena's baby, was determined, as only soaps can do, that the forever good and decent Marlena had been possessed by the devil. It's hysterical. <laughs> I told her. It was so funny to see. The best is if you don't watch it and you tune in and you just say, ah, la, 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 la. You know? <laughs> She was all of a sudden possessed. I will get you. It was so much fun. It was, uh, it was one of the most fun storylines that I have ever done. Because I've played for, you know, for over 20 years, a woman who is sweet and kind and gentle and patient and understanding. And all of a sudden, to put all that aside and say, I can be as mean and rotten and hurtful and scary as I want to be. And it's all forgiven. I mean, it's all excusable because I've been possessed. That means, in Jokus, in Tentosianum, Celebra. After a successful exorcism, Marlena was back to her good old self. Deborah was also back on nighttime. She did several TV movies and miniseries. She even performed with an elephant in Circus of the Stars. I can't imagine how it feels not to be able to get pregnant. I can't imagine how it feels to have the stick turn blue. In 1995, Deidre took on the roles of star and producer with a TV movie about her real-life road to motherhood. Infertility is like giving up your dreams one step at a time. There was so much confusion in the world about surrogacy. It was, people kept thinking that it, was, it is baby M, that women hate each other and it's all for money and there's, there's no caring to it and the kids are just bouncing. All this misconception about what surrogacy really is. And uh, she said, I think we ought to make a movie of the week about this and sort of tell the story, but also explain the process so that people who are interested in it can find out uh, um, uh, how it's done. That same year, Deidre and Steve welcomed their second son, Tully Chapin, born to the same surrogate mother. And Robin had said, you know, this went so well. If you want a sibling, I'm your girl. He's, he's completely loving. He's physical. He's, um, he wants to be on your lap or in your face, or if you turn away, he'll turn your face back towards him. And uh, he's, he's, he's the yummiest baby. He's, he's a great little fellow, you know. And the two of them are great together. 
When Intimate Portrait returns, Deidre Hall opens the door for many in need and closes another as she says goodbye to a loved one. He was a great kid, a good kid. Deborah Norville, Intimate Portrait, Deidre Hall, continues. In November of 1999, Deidre Hall and her family gathered back home in Florida to say goodbye to her big brother, Terry. He fell ill, and uh, we all raced home. And um, uh, we, by the time we got there, uh, it was fairly inevitable that he wasn't going to make it. It was um, 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 startling, although, you know, you know, Downs syndrome people don't always have long lives. I mean, he really had been an exception. Vital signs dropped. They called us right away. We were there in hours. And then by the time we all got there, had to make the decision about life support and, you know, those, those awful decisions. Uh, we just sat with him the whole time and um, told him what to do. You know, um, how to how to um, find the light and what to look for and who to look for and um, what a good boy he was. But he died exactly as he lived. He died surrounded by the entire family. It was a great little send off. It was a great kid. As her twin, I get to hear about the things that she does for people from all different places and it never surprises me but it makes me so proud of her she even takes time for her fans they love her because she loves them she was the person that invented um, um, soap opera luncheons fan club luncheons and her fans would come in from all over the country and she wined and dined them and she spoiled them when I would go to her fan luncheons, it was amazing. She knew these people's names, she knew their stories, and she really wanted to share with them her personal life. And when Mattel launched the Marlena Evans doll... <laughs> it's odd. Um, it's odd. My kids like it. It's fun for them. And the proceeds all go to path, so that's, I mean, that's the reason for doing it, obviously, not because I need a doll running around out there that looks like Marlena. A lot of time has passed since Deidre took the part of Dr. Marlena Evans in 1976. And the role continues. Our business is very unforgiving to women, and always has been. And I think that we keep trying to change it. But Deidre, she just goes against the entire stereotype of what happens to you um, as you get over 40. <laughs> Oh my God, I think she'll be as old as Methuselah if she wants to be. <laughs> <laughs> she ain't me for saying that. She could be the grand dame at any age of days of our lives. There are a few actresses who have that guarantee. I do see her as being part of the show only if we allow her time for her family. Uh, her family comes first. It, it's never struck me that anything was important except her kids. And I, for someone with a career, that's huge. And with someone as big of a career as that she has, it's unfathomable. When someone wants parenthood as much as Dee did and does, um, it, that's a wonderful thing to see. Someone who appreciates it and uh, puts the energy and time into it that it deserves. She is the uh, photo mom at the school. She goes up and takes all the pictures of the classes, all the events. She's forever making cookies and doing, uh, running a booth at the school fair. She's a marvelous wife. She's drop-dead gorgeous. She's just as good on the inside as she is on the outside. And um, uh, she's a fierce uh, uh, and devoted mother. I mean, you know, I think it's... You know, I got the best of the deal, let me put it that way, so I'm, I'm perfectly content. 
I really am living in such a happy place. My family is well and, and safe and happy. My job is in a wonderful place. My career is in a great place. My children are delicious. Life is good. You know, I'm so gifted and so lucky and so, um, and so grateful for it all.